So far in our discussion on recombinant DNA technology, we discussed two important applications of prokaryotic cells. So we said that we can use bacterial cells to basically replicate gene molecules to make many copies of a single DNA molecule of interest. And previously, we also said that if we modify a eukaryotic gene in a specific way by basically removing those introns and splicing together the exons to create this modified gene and then if we introduce that gene into a bacterial cell the bacterial cell can actually be used to produce the protein that is encoded by that eukaryotic gene so these are two important applications of, pre of prokaryotic cells now there's a problem with the second method the second method does not always work why is that well, that's because there is another difference that exists between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Unlike in eukaryotic cells, in prokaryotic cells, once the protein is synthesized, following translation, that protein is not modified in any way. But in many eukaryotic cells, many eukaryotic proteins are actually modified in different ways in the Golgi apparatus following trans uh, following translation and so what that means is we can add different types of components onto our protein for example sugar molecules and lipid molecules we can also cleave proteins in eukaryotic cells post translationally and these things cannot be done inside prokaryotic cells so prokaryotic cells simply don't have the machinery, they don't have the Golgi apparatus and other organelles to basically modify the proteins post-translationally. And what that means is the second method described here, producing eukaryotic proteins by introducing eukaryotic genes into prokaryotic cells cannot be done for all eukaryotic proteins because of what we just described. And that leads us directly to the next question. Can we actually introduce foreign eukaryotic genes into other eukaryotic cells? So instead of using prokaryotic cells to produce a desired eukaryotic protein, can we use eukaryotic cells, for example, animal cells, to actually produce copies of proteins, then extract the proteins and use those proteins for a variety of different purposes? So it turns out that we can actually introduce recombinant DNA molecules, foreign DNA molecules into certain eukaryotic cells, such as for example mouse cells, as we'll see in just a moment, and then these genes can basically use to express proteins, produce different types of proteins. Now, there are three methods that we normally use to basically inject a certain gene into a eukaryotic cell. Method number one we'll call injection with micropipette. Method number two we're going to call injection with a viral agent, specifically with a retrovirus. And method number three we're going to call transfection with calcium phosphate. Transfection simply means the introduction, the injection of that DNA molecule, the foreign DNA, into a eukaryotic cell without using any viral agent. That's what we mean by transfection. So <clears throat> let's begin with injection with a micropipette. So we essentially have this very, very small instrument called a micropipette that contains a very small diameter. And we can essentially hold the nucleus of the cell. So let's suppose this is the nucleus of our mouse cell. We can hold the nucleus on one end with some type of instrument, for example, a larger pipette. We can hold this in place while at the other end we poke with a special type Type of micropipette that contains that DNA fragment that we want to inject and so by injecting this nucleus of the cell can essentially accept and incorporate that DNA molecule into its genome and in the lab about 2% of the mouse cells that essentially are injected with this method will incorporate this DNA molecule into their cell genome 
Now let's move on to method number two, injection with viral agents. And the viral agents that are very effective are retroviruses. Why? Well, because retroviruses are these special viruses that contain reverse transcriptase. And what this enzyme does is it essentially reverse transcribes the RNA molecule into the DNA molecule. And once we produce that viral double-stranded DNA molecule in that cell, that viral double-stranded DNA molecule is then injected. It is incorporated into the cell's genome to produce something called a provirus or a proviral DNA. The proviral DNA is the genome, it's the DNA of that host cell that has incorporated that viral DNA that we injected. And the great thing about these retroviruses is most of the time they don't actually kill that cell, at least not immediately. So retroviruses can be very effective vectors. They can be used to bring four recombinant DNA molecules into the host animal cell and can incorporate it, that viral DNA molecule that we want to, into that host genome without actually killing that cell. Now, once we incorporate that DNA molecule into the host genome, that DNA is known as a provirus or a proviral DNA. And we can now use, the cell can use the proviral DNA to basically synthesize the proteins. And one of these proteins would be the protein that is encoded by that viral DNA molecule that we injected. So this is described by the following diagram. So this is a retroviral vector. So it basically is our virus that contains these blue molecules. The blue molecules are a molecule called integrase and integrase is an enzyme that is used to actually incorporate that DNA molecule into the host cell's genome. We have these purple molecules, which are the reverse transcriptase molecules, which reverse transcribe the RNA into the DNA. And so when these green molecules, these dark green molecules are injected into that cell, these are the RNA molecules. This purple, the reverse transcriptase, the purple enzyme basically creates this lighter green strand, which is basically our DNA molecule. And then this one also creates a DNA molecule. Those two DNA strands essentially combine to form a double helix DNA molecule. And then that goes into the cell and the blue enzyme, that integrase molecule now incorporates that into the host genome and that forms the proviral DNA. And now, and now this DNA can be used to synthesize the proteins of interest. <clears throat> of interest. Now, a common type of retrovirus that we use when we're dealing with mouse cells is the Maloney murine leukemia virus. And this is used because it can accept DNA molecules as large as 6,000 nucleotides in length. Now, the final method we're going to focus on briefly is known as transfection with calcium phosphate. And once again, transfection means the injection of that DNA molecule without actually using any type of viral agent. Now, what we do is we basically create a solution of calcium chloride DNA. So we have a solution in that solution. We have calcium chloride and we have a DNA molecule. And then we mix it with a special solution that contains phosphate ions. And once we mix these two solutions, that calcium phosphate will essentially form a precipitate with that DNA molecule. And by a mechanism that we don't yet quite know, don't yet quite understand, the cell incorporates that complex, including that DNA, into the cell by some type of endocytotic process. Endocytosis is simply the process by which we have a receptor-mediated process by which the cell invaginates and takes that into the cytoplasm of the cell. So basically, as shown in the following diagram. So we have that double-stranded DNA molecule that we want to inject into our cell. We have this calcium phosphate solution that combines with the DNA to basically form a precipitate, and then the cell uptakes that molecule, including that recombinant DNA, into the cell 
And then that DNA is incorporated into the cell's genome inside the nucleus. And by this method, we can basically produce proteins that are found within this DNA molecule. And so these are the three common methods by which we can basically inject our DNA molecules, these genes, into eukaryotic cells. So we see that not only can we use these prokaryotic cells to produce desired eukaryotic proteins, but we can also use in some cases eukaryotic cells to express and produce the proteins of interest.